Good afternoon and welcome to this edition of Fin Week Money Matters, the show that helps you manage your finances. I'm Alicia Second, my co-host this afternoon, Mark Ashton, who's editor of Fin Week. Well, on the show today, we'll be digging into the world of media and we'll be taking a look at the major players trying to answer the question of whether there still remains reasonable opportunities for print entrepreneurs. We also take a look at our lips as we, oh, we take a look at our lips as we look at the business of investing in wine. And that really taking me off guard there. And finally, we show you how to turn yourself into a personal brand. Please do send us any comments or feedback to moneymatters at avm360.com. Well, the South African media landscape is going through a major shift with the Times Media Group going through upheaval. Sekunjalo looking to revitalize the independent group in a 2 billion rand investment and the SABC in apparent turmoil. In its cover story this week, Fin Week takes a look at the major players and tries to answer the question of whether there still remains reasonable opportunities for print entrepreneurs. And joining us on the desk this afternoon is Fin Week journalist Garth Tennyson and Hon Harbour, uh, who who's Caxton Professor of Journalism at WITS, and from Cape Town, James Brent Steyn, who's uh, the Beelt's political correspondent. Welcome to you all. Thanks so much for Thanks joining us. Well, Mark, let's get straight into a look at why Fern Weeks decided to uh, put this as its cover story for this week. Look, I mean, I, I love the idea of media. I mean, media is one of the most, it's probably critical to everything we do, but we've got a, we've got a very exciting landscape in South Africa at the moment. You know, we, we've had very concentrated media. We've had big groups owning 80 to 90 percent of the market very limited opportunities for entrepreneurs to come through. So uh, we, we've seen big deals obviously in the last couple of weeks. We've seen the, the Times Media deal mm -hmm. going through and actually seeing some of the fallout from that. We've seen the um, the, the deal for Second Jalo to take control of the independent group from its Irish owners. And then, and then we've also been able to see like a number of smaller opportunities like um, there, there, there's Balls Radio, there's the Two Oceans Vibe Radio. There, there's, there's lots of little opportunities for entrepreneurs to start coming through. But we have a very fragmented and still dominant market place in, in places so it's kind of these there are opportunities for entrepreneurs but are they actually able to get their foot in the door so we thought we, we thought we'd look at the, the the industry as a whole and say who are the sort of media moguls that are going to be dominating South African media in the next couple of, of years and you know what are their strategies if you look at Caxton for instance they've gone more with this hyper locality mm -hmm. um, Andrew Bonnemore is doing a big clean out at times uh, at, at TMG and then you've got the you know we've got media 24 our own owners and, and, and we've had a look at it and said what are they trying to do and and what are the opportunities out there? Anton, what's your assessment of the media landscape in South Africa right now? And what does that spell in terms of opportunity? Certainly in the print sector, going through huge change in every possible way. And, and change always throws up opportunities. Old companies have trouble often adapting to the changes and that creates <laughs> space. Uh, certainly new media, new technologies make lower the barriers of entry. So I think that opens things up a little bit. Um, you're seeing the old companies creaking along, uh, trying to go through change, grappling with it, uh, with only partial success. Um, and we're watching carefully to see who in the end can succeed and who doesn't. Yeah, there's a lot of talk as well in this article about uh, you know the kind of demographic media caters to right now that we've got uh, specific media talking to a specific audience and that uh, in itself highlighting the kind of disparity we're faced with in South Africa. Garth, I mean, as a journalist yourself, what do you make of the operating environment right now and how easy it is or difficult it is to communicate to the South African citizenry? Well. Um I was speaking to Mark about this early on and I actually kind of disagree. I think one of the problems is South African, particularly print media, is trying to be everything to all people. Um, there's very few, in my view, um, newspapers that you can say this paper stands for that. Mm -hmm. um, you can pick up a newspaper, open the editorial and it says one thing and this page is a column saying the completely opposite. Um, there's not necessarily anything wrong with that but I'd, I just think there's perhaps space in the, in the landscape for a paper that takes, I mean, take the UK for example, certain papers stand for certain things. Um, why is it different in South Africa? Um, I think there's potentially an opportunity there. Um, the other problem though I feel is that everyone's talking about how digitization is killing print. Yes it is, but the other thing that's killing print is the poor quality in print. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've stopped buying newspapers because half the time you pay for it, you open it and there's nothing in there worth reading other than one or two stories. Um, I make a point of speaking to a lot of businessmen um, who 
work in investment holding companies, I often ask them, well, are you in, when are you going to get into the media? Are you interested in getting into the media? And they all say the exact same thing. I wouldn't touch print with a barge pole. Um, and eventually one of them will say, because most South African newspapers aren't worth the, the paper they're printed on. It's a harsh assessment, I know, but I, I honestly think it's the truth. <laughs> Let's get uh, James's opinion on this. James, I mean, a pretty harsh assessment coming through there, but to what extent do you agree with that co kind of commentary, bearing in mind the overly commercial nature of media right now? We've seen a commercial transformation happen of the entire media system. Good afternoon. Um, I, th I think the question that nobody's asking is, uh, is there still a demand for news? Which I, I honestly think the demand for news has never been higher than at the moment. And uh, the, the, the second point I'd like to make is as to the quality of newspapers at the moment, you have to start looking at, at the, the, the staff components for newspapers is in South Africa. Uh, staff uh, uh, newsrooms have been slashed. Uh, numbers are down. If you, if you just look in Parliament at, at the, 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 the small amount of journalists that have to cover a huge amount of work, um, I, I personally think that's one of the, one of the main reasons why the, 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 the content of, of daily newspapers today is probably not where it should be. It's because of, of uh, senior, senior staff at newspapers um, being given uh, packages to go on early leave, early retrenchments, um, new hirings not being made. Um, so in, in my opinion, there's, there, there's a very high demand for news um, and for the, for the, if the right person comes along and, uh, and tackles the news in the correct way, I, I, I still believe there is a future for newspapers. That, that being said, I do believe the digital side of, the, of things have to go hand in hand with print and anybody who doesn't see that is in for a wicked surprise. Mm -hmm. Anton, your response I to I that? I take issue here with the wholesome across the board trashing of uh, the print media <laughs> because I think it's it's a by cheap journalists. shot <laughs> by people who run newspapers <laughs> I think it's a cheap shot option. I think something that must be pointed out um, that we have the one area of real strength we have in this country and that we will suffer a great deal if we lose with newspapers is investigative journalism there is a fine and excellent tradition of investigative journalism in this country it's rooted in the newspapers it happens a bit on television and in other media but it's rooted in the newspapers and, um, you know, I'm just in the process of judging uh, the Taco Cape of the country's biggest investigative journalism award, and there's very, very fine quality. And if we don't have the newspapers chasing the Encandler type stories, mm -hmm. um, all of journalism and all of this country and all of the politics will suffer. Anton, is that happening uh, fast enough uh, simply because, uh, you know, we say that there's less state control over the media? Is there really? Oh, yes, our media is. Is pretty, is pretty damn free to say and do what it likes. And, and our investigative journalists are breaking remarkable stories, some of them are breaking remarkable stories without fear for their lives or their newspapers or their publications. I, I just, I mean, I agree with the Prof is saying. I think we've got some brilliant um, investigative journalists. But it's one thing to say if we don't have investigative journalism, all of journalism will, will suffer. While it's true, the fact remains is if you go and buy the Sunday Times, sorry to mention Sunday Times, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a paper that helps me illustrate a point. And you, once you've read the, the front page, there's very little else in there that's worth reading. And you can't expect a handful of investigative journalists to carry the rest of the paper. Um, while I absolutely agree with what the Prof is saying, you, ne you, you need a newsroom full of dynamic news hounds that are out there filling the paper with stuff that, uh, um, that people are prepared to pay for. You're not going to buy a newspaper based on one story. Um, and, and I think that's, that's where we've gone wrong in South Africa. We've got a handful of good people that carry a whole newsroom full of slackers. I, I think maybe the point that you, know, you and I would discuss a little bit off air, but maybe the question to Anton is, I mean, it feels like media companies for, for, a lot, for big periods of time have been run by essentially bean counters. They've, you know, if, if you look at Andrew Bonnemore running, uh, now taking over at Times Media Group, you, you almost have people that are thinking from a business perspective rather than being run by editorial people. And I understand the trade-off between editorial and business, but there, there almost seems to, we seem to have gone too far to the right in terms of conservative business people out there, and, and, and there's not an investment in newsrooms, and yes, I appreciate that the recession has probably contributed quite a lot to that, but are we going to see a, re a revitalization of the broader media? Look, the, the news business model that we've worked with for 150 years, the advertising-driven model, is in trouble, um, as, in, as in decline. We're only seeing a new model emerge, and in that transitional period, 
It's absolutely true that journalism and media and the quality of media is in a lot of places suffering. Um, and I say a lot of places because I think that the broad generalization yeah. um, is a mistake. Um, so we are going through difficult and challenging but also very exciting times. And we must accept newsrooms have shrunk because that model is in trouble. Mm. Uh, information, the value of information is going up, not down. The value of good quality, edited, selected, verified information is becoming more and more valuable. Okay. So I have no doubt that a new business model will emerge as we adjust to paying for that value. Mm -hmm. Delivering and then paying for that value. That's the root of it. How that happens now is changing, but it will happen in time. There's an interesting comment made by Warren Buffett in his letter to the shareholders this year, because uh, one of the investments he's actually been making is in print newspaper, but his investment has been into sort of hyper-local um, type of news. Same kind of model applicable in South Africa, do you think? That'll, do you think that that's a model that could be successful in South Africa in terms of focusing on hyper-local news rather than being in all things to all people? Um, look, I think you'll get many different kinds of media and the hyper-local is clearly an area of growth. Mm. But hyper-local financially also works very well on, on, online, on the internet. Yep. So I'm not sure um, newspapers will be there for long. But all of these things are quite unpredictable. I mean, Warren Buffett is really buying newspapers because he's picking them up cheap. Yeah. Um, and that's different in this country, interestingly. I mean, the sale of the independent group was not, I think, cheap. Correct. James, if we bring you into the conversation at this point, uh, let's take a look at what you are thinking of the skills base uh, right now when it comes to uh, the field of journalism as a whole. Is that an issue that needs to be addressed so that we can tackle the issue of quality a little bit more effectively? I don't think the skills base. I, th I, I seriously think there's a, there is a problem with the shortage of journalists um, and, and newsrooms that are not hiring. Um, I think we have very good journalists, uh, but, but writing an exclusive uh, news piece for a Sunday Times or any other newspaper, it, you don't just do that overnight. You can't do that every day. And, and to me, one of, the, one of, the, one of the, the, the places newspapers should look to to continue surviving is delivering exclusive copy and by doing that you need to give journalists time but with newsrooms having shrunk to the levels they have I think it's very difficult to to deliver exclusive copy while you have to keep the daily news on the roll as well so I, I don't think we have a, a huge problem with skills I think I, I just think we have a problem with newsrooms that are, that, that are too small and just as to the local content, just a small, uh, small comment, I think the, the newspapers that have grown the biggest, like Issa Leswe in, in KZN, ha it's a Zulu, Zulu newspaper and it's a local newspaper and it's doing phenomenally well. Um, I, I, so, 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 so local content, I think, is a, is a way, another, another thing to look for. Mm -hmm. James, I've got a question for you, and I'll bring you back onto safer territory, considering performance reviews are coming up. Um, SABC, you know quite well. Um, you know, what's your take on the sta state of play there at the moment? I mean, are we actually going to get a tidied up uh, national broadcaster, or are we still going to carry sort of crisis to crisis? <laughs> It's a difficult question. It would, it would depend on the president and who knows what he's thinking. Um, the president is sitting for a week with the resignation letters of the board chair and the board deputy chair of the SABC. Um, you're sitting with a COO position that hasn't been filled for a number of years. You've got a person who was acting, who is not acting at the moment, but who's refusing to leave his office. You've got a board that's in disarray. You've got a, a CFO that has been suspended. So you have no CFO in the, at the moment. Um, I, I think, personally, I think the SABC very much uh, uh, similar to SAA at the moment. You've got middle management and people at the bottom doing a great job keeping the news going, keeping the programs going. But whenever, you, whenever, you know, whenever there's a big decision that needs to be made, it's not happening. So, so they, they're going to keep making losses. They're going to keep rolling forward, lumbering forward, and, and with no clear direction in sight. I just want to say there's another threat to journalism. Um, and it's not just the business model, it it's goes back to content. In that, unfortunately, because we're, moving in, we're operating in a digital world, anyone with a keyboard and an internet connection can potentially be a journalist. Now, I'm of the belief that I think most journalists should be angry about that and say, well, hang on, I think we're better than the average person with a, with a keyboard um, and, a, and an internet connection. But the reality is that sometimes, and often, we're not. And there's a lot of very, very good content out there that gets produced for free. 
mm -hmm. because there's someone who's a strategist or they've got a business that they're running but they have this yearning to to want to express themselves in print and some of them produce excellent excellent copy that's available for free yeah. and while James and, the, and, and Prof were saying that demand for news has never been higher I couldn't agree more the difference is that it's so much easier to get news and get it without paying for it um, and get really good quality analysis as well without paying and for it. And how that comes about though because there's also a very big gap that needs to be filled. I mean this article uh, in Finweek specifically highlighting uh, the fact that there are different classes that talk to each other in the public discourses uh, but uh, you know from the same category of classes so to speak and we don't have conversations happening on the lower demographic scale. That's where we see uh, you know people picking up their keyboards and writing because they feel that they're not being catered to. I think we have to ask ourselves where does our national conversation happen? Mm -hmm. As the market fragments into niche audiences, where do we have a national conversation? Because even already I would say that the nation only comes together in one conversation around big events like the State of the Nation speech. Um, and, 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 and that's a huge gap opened up by the failures and limitations of the SABC, I must say, because that is where you would expect it um, to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's a big political issue. Um, as for, um, you know, the, the proliferation of voices and, out and outlets and people out there able to express themselves and do some interesting uh -huh. stuff, that's a fantastic de and enriching development. But interestingly, I think it makes journalism and editing the selection, the verification, mm. the choosing, the guiding of audiences to the better stuff. It's finding the tough stuff for which we're going to have to pay. But what does it take to turn journalism into an aspirational career? I mean, I get to interview a lot of young journalists and a number of them simply see it as a stepping point into communications, industrial communications. They, they don't see it as this is their career. This, they, they want to eat, eat and sleep. Choice. Yeah, they, they don't see it as a, a career choice. They don't want to eat and sleep journalism. They, they're simply wanting to write stories, which you know, there, there's a big difference between writing stories and being a journalist. And, and, I, and I don't know how we get to that point where it becomes an aspirational career in South Africa. That's a very good and difficult question. I think these things are cyclical mm. and we're in turmoil and uncertainty <coughs> and, in a sh and, in, and newsrooms are shrinking. So I think that makes it difficult for people to, to see it in the same way they saw 20 years ago. But I think it will turn around. Okay, so evolution Mark, happened if I, if there. Uh, was that James coming in from uh, Cape Town? Yeah, if, if, I can just, if I can just jump in there. I, I, I disagree in a way, Mark, I'm sorry. So simply, I think journalism is a very aspirational career. People are very excited about the, the, the job. Um, they, I think it's an exciting career. It's a great career. But the, the, the two main issues is simply there's no, there is an investment by companies into their journalists. And number two, the career path for journalists. Um, if you want to be a, a journalist for the rest of your life, you're probably not going to be earning much. So you see top journalists jumping from one publication to the other just to earn more money. Or um, if you don't want to be a journalist for the rest of your life, you have to go into management. And I, I have a bit of a problem with that because we're losing a lot of top journalists that become managers that have a problem in, in managing uh, the newspapers. So in my opinion, I do think it is aspirational. Um, I just think that looking at your newsrooms and investing into the companies, that is the issue. Yeah, I mean, I guess my rebuttal would be that y you've obviously lived, y you are an, probably an exception in a lot of cases. You're passionate about what you do. You love the parliamentary stuff. But to, to instill that same value into a 20-something going into the market who's just come out with a with a, a basic journalism qualification, it's not quite as easy. They, they, they're not passionate about the, the, you know, my, my, my sense is people are not keen to learn. They're, they're not keen to be curious, maybe is the better way to phrase it. And in which case, they, they, they see themselves as story, either storytellers or columnists. I mean, they, you know, that, that's my, my, my feeling when I sit down. Are, are they trying to tell a story or do they see themselves as columnists slash thought leaders because they run a blog online? And, and, and that frustrates me in that they stop learning the moment they become journalists. They, 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 they don't want to get better. They don't want to upskill themselves. They often sit in the positions where they simply are regurgitating things that they've seen everywhere else and, and I think that that's probably my frustration when I talk about aspiration. It's hard for people mm. to be passionate when but they're being paid 10,000 rand a month um, to you know put some words down on a, on a page and, that, and quite frankly that's one of my bugbears. I think most people who run media companies i.e. accountants think that that's what journalists do. They put some words on a page mm -hmm. that you can sell an advert next to and, there's v and I agree with James there's very little investment 
in, in journalists. I remember when I started out, I was thrown in front of a computer and said, there, be a journalist. And I kind of figured it out um, as, I, as I went along. I learned more in my first year at a major wire service, um, international wire service, than I did in all the years before that, and that includes university. Um, I did enroll initially in a uni uh, um, to study journalism at university. I spent six months learning about how some guy trekked up from the Eastern Cape with a, with a printer, learning about the history. I wasn't interested in that. I wanted to learn how to be a journalist. And, and I really think that there's a big shortfall in, in that aspect in South Africa. Yeah. I know the profs can have a <laughs> so, so I spent this morning with 17 entry level students. Um, doing our, our honours uh, entry into journalism. Bright, keen, passionate, enthusiastic. They were selected from maybe 100 applicants. Um, um, smart, they could be doing things that would earn them much better. Um, whether they'll stay in journalism all their lives, I don't know. Um, but they were already doing good stuff, exposing uh, sexual harasses on WITS campus mm -hmm. um, and leading on that mm -hmm. story. So I must say, I'm much more optimistic about that. And they have strong role models. If I ask who their role models are there, they roll them out among the senior journalists uh, in our country and the best journalists. Okay, so development taking place there. If we're talking about investments being made in this industry, though, and let's bring it back to the media landscape as a whole here. We've had uh, the Media Development and Diversity Agency uh, coming to the fore, and uh, the, the article specifically highlighting that it continues to escape scrutiny, that it's not doing what it should be doing, Anton, in developing grassroots media and community media. What do you make of these investments that are being made right now and the effectiveness of bodies like this in the long run? You know, I think we have very good policy and the idea of the MDDA in, in giving arm's length state support for community, local um, alternative media is a very good one and we've seen it succeed in many European countries, for mm -hmm. example. Um, but it takes a political will, and I actually I don't think they've got the resources and the money to do a serious job. And that there, and uh, bringing us to the question that you raised earlier in terms of who actually controls the media in the first place, and are we going to see a shifting of this landscape if we are still, uh, you know, not getting implementation on the grassroots level right? Yeah, I mean, I, I saw a fascinating thing just just on the way here. Somebody contacted me about a, a small publication that that is based in Pretoria. And ironically, it's, it's managed to grow at Cirque for the last couple of years, which is an impressive thing for a print publication to do anyway. But they've managed to do it, they're, they're entirely funded by, the, by Dutch development money, f funding um, in South Africa. So that, you know, it's very interesting that, it, that a Dutch organization is actually funding grassroots media in South Africa. And I agree, I think that there is political will. There's a, you know, vibrant media is good for, for, for South Africa as a whole. We just don't seem to be able to coordinate efforts. And I think that when you look at the disarray that's at the SABC, that's kind of our flagship media, and we don't seem to have any real, you know, yeah. you can see there's no leadership there. James, from your end, I believe you're, you're jumping off your seat with a comment on uh, the conversation that's happening here <laughs> in Johannesburg. So <laughs> let's bring you in at this point. Well, what, what can I say? You have, you have the MDDA, whose CEO is a board member of the SABC. So if, if, if media diversity is so important, surely he'd be doing a better job, with all due respect, at the SABC of, of getting them to sort their, 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 their ship out. Um, regarding uh, diversity, I think everybody would love to be more diverse. Regarding media ownership, I think uh, I'm a little concerned about where media ownership is going, given what we've seen at the independent group with Second Jalo taking it over. We, we, un we, we know what happened last year, I think it was last year, it might have been earlier this year with the New Age uh, debacle and the allegations that, that the Democratic Alliance were making about this exact Second Jalo takeover of Independent, it, it happened as they said. As we know, Second Jalo Group is a very big government supporter, so one, one could argue media ownership is moving towards being more government controlled. It's a, it's a, it's a cause for concern in my opinion. Um, as to the, the, the private, 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 indus, uh, private industry owning media, I don't think it, it is working out for them as well as, 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 as they would like it to be with ad, uh, ad in income on the decline. So w where it's going to all end up, I don't know, but um, I just hope they figure it out. Well, let's leave the conversation there for now. Thanks to Anton Harbour, who is the Caxton Professor of Journalism at WITS, and from Cape Town, James Brent Stein, who is the Beals political correspondent. It's time now for a quick look at our Finweek Trade of the Week.
Okay, so let's take a quick look at what you've got on the table for us this week. African Bank. I mean, so we, we've been we've been talking about African Bank for a couple of times in the last few months, and obviously the whole issue around micro lending is creating a little bit of consternation. African Bank has.